Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about, <clears throat> check this out. We're going to talk about crushing your competition with killer keywords. Now, I don't want you to think about the old way of thinking about keywords. We're going to talk about a new way of thinking about keywords. And rather than call it crush your competition, I want you to think of it as outsmart your competition. Because, yeah, you're trying to crush them, right? But really, you don't really care if they die or not. Actually, remember that old joke? Uh, two guys are camping in the woods, speaking about camping, and all of a sudden they encounter a bear. So they start running as fast as they can. They're running, they look back, and the bear's coming. And it's like, wow, do you think we can be able to outrun the bear? He's like, I'm not trying to outrun the bear, I'm just trying to outrun you. <laughs> right? You know, that, it's a dumb joke, right? Ha ha. But, but the thing is, you're not trying to crush your competition. You don't care if your competition goes out of business, you just want to make sure you're always out in front of them. So, how to outsmart your competition. Before we get into the guts of what I want to talk about, first let's do a little thought experiment. Imagine your local Target store or whatever store you like to shop in, okay? Mentally put yourself inside a Target. What does it look like when you walk in, right? Let's pretend you went in to buy one particular thing, just one. Let's say it's a flat screen TV. When you walk into Target to buy your flat screen TV, you're going to walk by the motor oil, you're going to walk by the wiper blades, you're going to walk past the auto department like these guys are doing, you're going to walk past a hundred other things, right? And chances are you're going to see dozens and dozens of different brands, different products, different things on the shelf are going to catch your eye. Then when you finally figure out what you're going to buy and stick it in your cart, you're going to walk out. You're going to pass the shampoo aisle, you're going to pass the cosmetics aisle, you're going to pass all the other aisles on your way out. And eventually, you're gonna probably, if you're anything like me, you're gonna fill your cart with a bunch of other stuff you never intended to buy when you walked in in the first place. And by the way, does anybody know why there are so many kinds of shampoos to pick from? I mean, really. Anyway, once you finally get to the checkout stand, what happens? Your, your barrage of products is not over, right? Because look what they do to you here. Now, I want you to imagine what it would be like if instead of shopping in the real Target, instead of shopping in the regular Target, we shopped in instead a magical Target. The magical Target is very different. The magical Target, when you walk into it, looks exactly like this. And in this new magical Target, let's pretend the regular one in your neighborhood shut down and this one replaced it. When you walk in, you see nothing, absolutely nothing. Now, there are products here. They're just invisible. You can't see them. Every product in the magical target is invisible to you. You can't see a single one. So how do you buy anything in this new magical target? What you have to do is you have to walk in and you have to say what you're looking for. You have to say why you came into target that day. You have to walk in and say, 40-inch <clears throat> flat screen TV. And then lo and behold, anything that matches 40-inch flat screen TV magically becomes visible. You get to look at 10 or maybe 15 of them that come, become visible and you have to pick one. Hmm. Now, if you were coming in for shampoo and you said, shampoo, of the hundreds and hundreds of kinds of shampoo, only 15 would become visible. Now here's the kicker. Imagine that you're selling shampoo or marketing shampoo or manufacturing shampoo. How do you make sure that your shampoo is the one that becomes visible among those 15? That's the question. But also think about it this way. As a consumer, how do you know that those first 15 things that become visible are the ones you really want to buy? What if it was the 16th thing that you really would prefer to purchase, but you saw these 15 other things they put in front of you instead? Right now, imagine, what if this magical target opened up in your neighborhood? Would you just be like, oh, they made a few changes around here. Oh, this is all right, I can deal with this. Or would you go, what the heck just happened? What kind of place did I, well, I see someone nodding, right? Would you just go, oh yeah, no problem, I can shop in this magical target, blah, blah, blah. Or would you go, what? We would talk to the manager, whatever, what, what the heck happened here? We would never shop in a Target that looked like that. However, we do it every single day. Where do we do this every day? Google, Google Amazon, whatever. In it, this is our new reality. Our offline Target shopping experience has become the magical Target when we shop online. Right? And I think you all agree that a lot of people shop online. So I got a little video I want to show you. Let me pop out of here real quick. It's going to work. It's going to work. Click on the video. Bear with me. I apologize. I know this is kind of a... Uh, ch -ch -ch. <laughs> la, la, la. All right, here we go. Cross your fingers if you can hear this. And... No, no, what is going on here?
<laughs> Fantastic. I love that. So uh, par pardon me while I take a second just to jump back into my slides here. Maybe the, uh, maybe the tech guy can come up and give me a hand while I'm talking. But the point, the point of that little video was that words matter. The context of words matter. What you said before the words matter. What you say after the words matter. The words you include at the end of that word. Trevor mentioned about his long tail words. Most of us, when we search, some of us will put just a few words in. Other of us will put longer words in. Many of us will put lots of words in our searches. Now, here's the thing. If you don't like the first 15 things that come back when that magical target turned on 15 things for you, if you liked the 16th thing, chances are you're going to get used to this idea that you need to add more words and you'll probably add some variations. So typically the way people start searching is they will add more and more things as they need to find more and more specific types of products. And so like we kind of alluded to earlier, a lot of folks will search with plenty of different kinds of words. So. The moral of that story is, as marketers, as manufacturers, as merchants, as whatever your role is in business, how you describe products and services and anything that you're selling or marketing, the way you describe those has to be, absolutely has to be the way your customer describes those. If there's only one nugget you remember about me today, or if there's only one thing you can remember about being in this little room in this cozy little, uh, you know, what, what I love about this is you go into a stadium, big giant stadium, there's tens of thousands of people there. Where do the VIPs go? They go into the little teeny suite, right? The little teeny suite behind the glass. And people are like, ooh, who are those few folks up in there? I kind of feel like this room back here is sort of the VIP suite of the event, you know what I mean? It's not the big hall where everybody is, it's like where the magic is happening in our little intimate in a setting. So, so in the VIP room, what I wanted to say is if you remember only one thing about me or one thing about what's happening today, I hope you stash this one little nugget away. Let me say it again, maybe two more times, and that is how you describe your product and services or whatever it is that you're marketing or selling, that has to be how your customers, the people that you're after, the eyeballs you're trying to attract, the money that's coming in, the whatever it is your product and service is, the people you want to engage with, you have to describe what you describe your product as or service as what they're looking for. And often, we're not smart enough to figure that out. We typically don't know how our customers use and, and phrase their searches and, and what they're typing into Google or what they're typing into Amazon. We typically aren't smart enough to know. Now, how do you figure out, if you're not smart enough to know, how do you figure out what your customers are searching for, what your potential sales leads are searching for, what your market, uh, and actually I want to chat with Amy again for a second. I don't, I don't mean to call you out, but, but since, since you were chatting earlier, uh, uh, Amy, as you all heard just a moment ago, is in the hospice industry, right? Yeah. I, I recently, about a year ago, lost my mother, and hospice was actually invaluable. So I want to thank you and everyone who does what you do for the help you gave my family personally. Thank you. But even in your industry, when we were searching for some care for my mother, we described the services that we were looking for in very different ways than the hospice industry was describing the services that we were looking for. Now, there's a few things that you could imagine, uh, care for my mom, a place for my mom, those types of phrases, but as we were searching for it, we never used exactly the same words that typically the, the hospice places would use, and there was kind of a disconnect. So we had to search again and search again and search again. We finally, of course, found what we were looking for, but it took a while. The point is, if the companies had figured out how the customers were searching, it would have been a much easier fit. So, what are the different ways that you can figure out how your customers are searching for you, how your sales leads are searching for you, how your, how your the, the money in people's pockets is just dying to fall out of their wallet and into your lap? How do you find those people? Well, a great idea, I think, is just listen, right? Stop trying so hard. Listen to the people that talk to you. When you finally get a customer in the front door, if you have a front door, or if you've got a, a digital front door, when you've got customers, when you've got paying customers, listen to how they talk about your products. One of my favorite examples is we were chatting about uh, casserole pans. Casserole pan this, casserole pan that, and they're like, oh, you mean the baking dish? And baking dish and casserole pan. I would have never thought that baking dish was the same thing as casserole pan, all that silly, because uh, it sounds like the exact same thing, right? I said, you naughty. But to my mind, a baking dish is what you bake in, right? In a casserole pan, I had no idea what a casserole pan was. Anyway, the point is, your customers will always describe products slightly differently than the way you think about them. So listen, just listen. The other thing you can do is ask. 
Ask your customers how they talk about products, how they describe products. Uh, one of the things I like to do sometimes if I'm kind of stuck on how to describe a product is I'll actually go into a Target, uh, the real one, not the magical one, and I'll sit there. Of course, I'll listen also, but sometimes I'll just ask a random stranger. Try this experiment. If, if you sell or market a physical product, try this experiment. Go to the store where the product's actually sold, Target or wherever. Stand in the aisle. Wait for a... a, a customer or a, a, just a random stranger to come by, whip out your phone and say, oh, dang it, I just can't, and start muttering yourself, just can't find this product anywhere, oh, ah, and then say, oh, excuse me, I'm trying to buy this on Amazon because I want to get a better price, but I just can't find that on Amazon. Uh, what do you think I would just search for to find it? I know it's silly, right? But the person might say, oh, you're trying to buy that casserole pan? You're like, Casserole pan, that's right. I never would have called it a casserole pan. Anyway, it's a silly little experiment, but the point is you can draw out of random strangers, even if they're not your customers, how people describe products and how they talk about things. And the last thing is I love eavesdropping in a store. So the last time I was in Target, I was hanging out, in, not hanging out, but I was walking by the jewelry section. I don't really hang out in the jewelry section very often. And I heard someone walk up to the counter and they asked for a bib necklace. Well, that caught my ear because I had no idea what a bib necklace was. Apparently, I found out later it was one of those necklaces where it had a bunch of strands go back and forth and it looks like a bib. Okay, yeah, it makes sense. But I didn't know what a bib necklace was. So I like, huh, what the heck's a bib necklace? So I listened. Oh, and then when they were explaining that here's the bib necklace right here and they lift one up and they showed the customer, I'm like, oh, now I just figured out what a bib necklace is. is if I was at all connected with the jewelry industry, of course I'm not, but if I was at all connected with the jewelry industry, I just would have learned a little new nugget about how someone described a necklace. Now, here's my favorite way. Let's pretend that you're involved in the business of marketing or selling or manufacturing or whatever your role is, barf bags, all right? Now, I think of them as barf bags. That's how I would describe it. I assume that you would describe it other ways, right? How, would you, how else would you describe a barf bag? Anyone? Just throw it out. I can't quite hear you. Barf bag, yeah, that's exactly how you think of it, right? How about air sickness bags? Would you be willing to bet that there's a customer out there looking for your barf bag, but instead of typing barf bag, they may type air sickness bag? I think they might, right? So there's a little, I don't know if anyone, is anyone here in the business of selling barf bags? No? All right, fantastic. Well, if you, if you were, we'd ask you. But the thing is, air sickness bag, barf bag, there's probably a bunch of different ways to describe this. Aha, uh -huh. check out my next favorite tip for you guys. If you go to Amazon, and if you type in barf bag or air sickness bag, and then you scroll down and read the reviews, you will see words that you probably in a million years would have never thought of. So, oh, I do have a laser pointer. So right here, uh, well, actually, just let me read the whole thing for you. This bag, these bags are coming in handy for me and my pregnancy. Aha, uh -huh. never in a million years as a dumb man would I have thought of course, if I was selling air sickness bags, I would have made sure to figure this out before I got into business with it. But never in a million years would I have figured out that the word pregnancy could be associated with air sickness bags. They fit perfectly in my purse. Another great word. I always keep one beside my bed for those morning and night sicknesses. Fantastic. Even if I was smart enough to figure out morning sickness on my own without listening to someone else tell me that that's a great phrase to use when I'm selling barf bags, I probably would have never thought night sickness. As a dumb man, morning sickness is all I know. Night sickness, I had no idea. And they are leak-proof as well. Wow. If Now, this is a silly made-up example, right? But if I was in the business of marketing or selling or advertising barf bags, I probably would have been smart enough to know air sickness bags is something I should also use to describe my product. But never in a million years would I have figured out pregnancy, morning sickness, night sickness, leak-proof. Never in a million years would I have figured out that kind of stuff. Did I have to work hard to get it? Was it some like magical thing journey I had to go on to uncover these magical phrases that my customers are using when they're searching for barf bags? No, no, it was sitting right there in Amazon. Okay, now this is a lot easier than knocking on every customer's door. Hello, ma'am, we're taking a survey of, uh, I noticed you ordered a case of air sickness bags and we were just wondering if you could answer a few questions. That's exactly what I did by just going to Amazon and reading. It's all right there. Now, how important is this really? What if I jump into business and try to market and sell or whatever my role is, air sickness bags, without doing this kind of research? Could I possibly gain any modicum of success? Maybe. 
probably. I could probably optimize my business in all kinds of different ways, get a little bit of growth, but in order to connect with the most number of people possible, in order to connect with all the people out there that are searching for my service or my product in all the many different ways that they search, I need to be able to throw my product or service out there, describe my product or service in the exact same ways that they are looking for it. So that one takeaway I want you to remember is their phrases, their terms, their search phrases, their keywords, however you think of it, what they're doing to find me has to be my way of describing me. Okay, there's another way. You can also use a tool. I'm partial to one in particular, but there's lots of tools out there that'll tell you what people are searching for. I wanna caution you, however, that if you use a tool like Google or anything based on search engines, you may find a lot of traffic, a lot of search volume, a lot of people searching for things that really have no purchase intent. They might not want to buy anything. I was chatting with a nice guy a few days ago, and he sells of all crazy things. He's in the business of selling things specifically limited to the French Revolution. I don't know why he chose such a niche product or niche industry to get into, but he sells things related to the French Revolution. And he says to me, whenever I use regular SEO tools, now using any tool to find how your customers are looking for you is better than using no tool to find how your customers are looking for you. But whenever I use the ones that just use search engine data, I discover that there's a thousand ways that people search for items related to the French Revolution that aren't items at all. Their research tasks, it's kids doing their homework, it's people building uh, papers for their studies, it's all kinds of other reasons, but not to buy things. So my caution is, make sure as you're looking to do your keyword research, that you figure out somehow that there's purchase intent behind these keywords. Now, <clears throat> what do I do with these keywords? So let's say that you've read the reviews on Amazon, you pulled out golden nuggets from there. Let's say you've actually talked to random strangers who are walking around in a store. Let's say you've eavesdropped as people talk about the products that you're selling or are marketing. What do you do with these phrases? So in my case now, okay, I figured out that morning sickness is a great thing for barf bags. Even though they don't seem immediately related, when I think about it, yep, it's obvious. I should have thought about it. What do I do with these phrases? All right, well, let me tell you about a lady named Elena. She's a wonderful person. I bumped into her twice. The first time I met her, I was explaining the importance of keywords, kind of like I'm doing right now. And there was a few folks who were skeptical listening to me. They're like, yeah, but, yeah, but. And all of a sudden, she jumped into the conversation, and she wanted to kind of take over. I'm like, uh-oh, uh, what, what's she, what she going to say here? Is, am I going to want to give control of this uh, little chit-chat to a random stranger who just walked in? So I'm like, all right, well, here. I stepped back, and I said, go ahead. Let's talk about keywords. So what she said is that she runs, and she does, she runs a storefront that sells jewelry. It's called Bling Jewelry. I like Elena a lot, although I don't get any cut from her sales, but if you're looking for some jewelry, I suggest you go to blingjewelry.com. She's also in Amazon with an Amazon storefront, so whichever way you buy, if you're looking for jewelry, buy some from Elena. She's a nice lady, but she said that she's got a, an Amazon storefront in her own .com where she sells jewelry of all kinds, bracelets and... Uh, help me out. And she sells, she sells necklaces, she sells bracelets, she sells uh, rings, she sells all the different kinds. You can tell I don't buy jewelry much because they don't even come to the top of my head when I try to think of all the kinds of jewelry. But she said she wanted to get into the anklets. She wanted to start selling anklets. And so she contacted her manufacturer and she took a big inventory of anklets and she started trying to sell them. Well, they didn't sell very well. And so what she did is she tried to discover some tools that would help her find some different keywords that would help her connect better with her audience. Just intuitively, she knew without being told or reminded that she had to describe her products in the exact same way that customers were searching for them. So she discovered uh, the little tool that I make, and, and I won't bore you with about what I do, I'll, maybe a slide at the end, but she discovered my little tool, the thing that looks like this, and she did a quick search for anklets. And what she discovered was, I don't know if you can see this, let me get out of the way. What she discovered was, that this tool suggested that anklet was probably the best keyword to use, and she knew that already. She didn't need anybody else to tell her. But then she was wondering if this was actually the right kind of research to do, because this tool suggested that the very next phrase that was high volume, people's looking to buy anklets, search for hot wife anklet. Hot wife anklet. The very next phrase after that was swinger anklet. Swinger anklet. So she was a little bit skeptical, as of course she should be, and as anyone should be, because when she went out to look how people were searching for anklet, she found a tool that suggested that hot wife anklet and swinger anklet were two great words to jump into. And I did a little research. I don't know much about it, honestly, but apparently if, uh, if, if you wear an anklet on one side, it means a certain thing. If a lady wears an anklet on another side, it means a certain thing. I don't really know, I'm not the expert, but there's a group of folks out there that when you wear anklets on their certain side, it means a certain thing. 
I had no idea. And frankly, Elena, who sells anklets, had no idea. There was this whole volume of people out there doing whatever, God knows what, with their anklets on their right and left feet that were searching for anklets. However, the anklet manufacturers of the world really didn't know about how customers were searching. There was this rift. There was this disconnect. Customers searching in a certain kind of way, manufacturers and sales and marketing describing products in a certain kind of way, and they never really knew about each other. They never really connected. And that's the gap we're trying to fix here today. And so what she did is she said, you know what? I don't really want my brand associated with Hot Wife and Swinger. I mean, I don't really know exactly what that means. I think I have a guess what that means, but I don't want my brand to be associated with that kind of stuff. So what she did is instead of changing the name of her anklets or instead of changing the packaging or instead of changing anything, actually, she just updated her search terms. Inside of Amazon, I don't know how many people are selling physical product here, but inside of Amazon, you can actually update your search terms, which informs the matching algorithm, which of the 15 things they should turn turn on when someone searches for something. So in the magical target, what she was doing now is when someone walks into target and says swinger anklet, she was telling the Amazon matching algorithm that she should be turned on for people who say that when they walk into the magical target. And what she told me was after she had done that, after she had plugged in hot wife and swinger, remember she was just testing this theory that she went from I couldn't sell a single one to I can't keep them in stock. Now, I can't claim all the credit for that. I can't claim any credit for that, honestly, because I wasn't smart enough to reach out to the world of people searching for anklets and figure out how they search, okay? But when we suggest that there may be a large volume of people out there searching for products in a slightly different way, and then she takes the leap of faith to try to describe her products in that way and suddenly makes a connection and is wildly successful, she deserves a credit for being that smart. So... Fantastic. That's one of my favorite success stories because it seems counterintuitive. It seems counterintuitive to describe your product in anything other than the physical aspects of your product. What seems intuitive to me if I was selling physical products online or even if I was marketing services, what seems intuitive to me is describe the product, describe the service, describe the opportunity, describe whatever it is I'm selling. And don't worry about how people are going to use my product or service, just describe the product or service. So in the case of anklets, I would say, well, it's uh, four inches around, it's made out of silver, it's got some dangly stuff on it, it's got a little clasp. I would describe the physical aspects of the product, and it would never really occur to me to think about how people are searching for it, how they're going to use it. Even with a non-physical non product, a digital good, a, a book download, a service you're going to sell, uh, even then, don't just stress and focus only on the nature of the product, of the service itself. Think about how people are going to use the product or the service. Think about how people are going to engage your service, hire your services to accelerate their business. <clears throat> now, just changing vacation to holiday, what did he say exactly? I want to get it right. Increased our traffic a thousand times. I met Jacob here just yesterday. He uh, is from WeWork in Astoria. If anybody lives here in New York and needs a co-working place to go, I suggest WeWork in Astoria. Uh, not because I've ever been there, but because Jacob was so nice and seemed very customer focused. So that's why I can recommend it. But Jacob said, I was explaining what it is, that, uh, the, the reason that I'm here and what I'm going to talk about and why keywords are important. Jacob said, oh, okay, I get it. I get it. Just like when I was chatting with Trevor. Trevor's like, you know what? You need to make some tweaks to your business so people can understand it better. The golden bombs. And thank you again, Trevor. But I was chatting with Jacob and he said, you know what? now I finally get what you do and the light went on for him and he's like this is super important stuff because back in the day when we were all doing SEO I was hired by a company to tweak their vacation website and with a simple change of vacation to holiday man we just a thousand times in their traffic so let me just close I'd love to take your questions or whatever maybe I have a little extra time for the next speaker to come up here but let me just close by saying if there's only one thing you remember about me only please remember that how you describe your products and services, whatever it is that you're marketing or selling or manufacturing, whatever it is you do to make money, remember to stay focused on the customer. But more specifically, remember to describe your product or service in exactly the same terms that your customer will use to describe their product or service. So that's my advice for you. That's my uh, please, please remember one thing. Please do one thing. If you take one action about anything you've heard here today, Go figure out how customers are searching for you. Go figure out what's in the mind of your customer when they're looking for you. Go figure out what the problems your customers are trying to solve are and use their exact same phrases to describe your product or service as they do when they're looking for it. Now, let me just tell you, wrap up and tell you a little bit about me. <clears throat> I make a little tool called Merchant Words. 
Uh, we're going we're to spin out with a brand new thing that we're going to call buyer words. And thank you very much for that golden nugget. Buyer words are what you're really looking for. You're looking for the people who have money in their pocket, who have the $100 bills just ready to fall out of their fingertips, and they're looking for something. They're out there looking to spend their money on a product, looking to spend their money on a service. You need to connect with those people. You need to find the words that buyers use when they shop. You need to find the buyer words. So we make a tool called Merchant Words. Our existing keyword tool is normally $30 a month, but I'd be happy to let you try it out with a discount. Now, unlike the phone company, that discount will stay forever if you love us. If you love us, you'll only pay $9 a month forever. This is like my deal for you. Uh, if you don't love us, that's fine. I'd be happy to give your money back. I got no problem with it. In fact, I don't want your money if you don't want to give it to me. But if you like our keyword tool, we'd love to have you give it a try. Let me know what you think. We've got an upcoming tool. I'd love to have you try this in beta. This beta version will let you take a chunk of content, your 500-word article, your SEO landing page, your blog post, whatever it is, we'll let you copy it and paste it. We will go top to bottom and analyze every single one of those words and tell you which one of those are the buyer words and which ones of those aren't buyer words. That's our product that we're going to have in beta soon. I'd love to have you take an early look at it before we let everyone in the world, and I'd love to get your feedback. Now, if you'd like to help me out and uh, check out our beta, please go to merchantwords.com slash digimarcon. There'll be a box there where you can type in your email address for me. And I promise I'm not going to stick you in the top of my sales funnel and pound you with emails. I may email you maybe twice at most. But what I want you to do is let me know that you're interested in helping us out looking at this beta. And I'd love to get some feedback from you in the coming months. And once we get it perfect, based on your feedback, we're going to roll it out publicly to everybody. This is our new product that we're working on. If you need to get in touch with me for any reason, uh, my inbox is terrible. I, honestly, I get uh, criticized all the time for not staying on top of my inbox, and it's true. I'm working hard on that. But my email address in blue that you can't read down here is george at merchantwords.com. I'd love to hear you if you want to reach out to me. The better way to connect with me actually is on Facebook. Uh, you'll have to see pictures of my vacation. And so uh, if you connect with me right now on Facebook, I'll accept your friend request, and you have to stare at pictures of me on top of the Empire State Building. That's what we uh, did earlier. But, but the point is, if you, if you would like to reach out with me and say, hey, I heard what you had to say. I have some questions. I want to follow up with you. I want to check out the beta, whatever you're working on. Connect with me through email. Connect with me on Facebook. I would love to help you in any way I can. Because, you know, honestly, at the end of the day, it's not about trying to grab some money out of your pockets. It's about trying to empower you with a little bit of more knowledge, a little bit of more suggestions, uh, a little bit of... Uh, a little bit of, uh, if you're selling anklets, a little bit of some kooky suggestion on how you connect with some crazy set of folks looking for your products in a slightly different way. I just want to make sure to give you the information you need to be a little bit more successful. And so please connect with me, and I'll help you any way I can. So that's my message for you. That's what I got, and I appreciate you listening. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you.